If you drop a magnet down a copper pipe, it seems to experience a resistance force acting against it, despite the copper being non-magnetic. This is caused by the magnets generating electrical currents in the copper called eddy currents, and these eddy currents create a magnetic field within the copper that oppose the permanent magnet, almost like an invisible, no-contact frictional force acting between the magnet and the copper. Now my plan is to use a metal disc and a disc full of magnets mounted very close to one another to potentially create some kind of magnetic clutch to replace the gear system on a bicycle. I started by cutting two discs on my CNC router, one from aluminium and one from copper. The reason for this is I'm not sure which is the best material for this application. My intuition would say copper as it's far more conductive than aluminium, but if you ask Google, it claims aluminium is the best and has a research paper to back it up. However, the majority of eddy current demonstrations use a copper pipe, but maybe this is because copper pipes are easier to source from plumbing stores. In a recent video uploaded by Veritasium about the world's strongest magnet, he drops a sheet of copper and aluminium at the same time within a strong magnetic field, and the aluminium sheet seems to fall far slower, indicating a greater resistive force. So I've 3D printed this axle as part of a test rig to allow the disc to freely spin. I can then mount a set of magnets either side of the disc without making any contact. Then I can hang a weight via a length of string to apply a constant torque on the disc, which should provide a reliable way to measure the resistance produced by the magnets. For reference, this is the descent rate with and without the magnets. The reason the non-magnet test is still slower than freefall is because it has to overcome the inertia of the disc. But how does the aluminium compare to the copper? The copper clearly has the best braking force as the disc spins 38% slower than the aluminium disc. Which makes sense as copper is about 54% more electrically conductive over aluminium. But the reason why the copper sheet fell faster in the Veritasium video is probably due to copper weighing over three times more than aluminium. So although the resistive force in the magnetic field might be a bit stronger, the weight of the sheet skews the results. In fact, even if I run my test without the magnets at all, the copper will still win due to the extra inertia of the heavier disc. Because of this, I only measure the RPM of the disc at the end of the descent, when the disc has finished accelerating and is spinning at a constant speed. And it's clear that with the grades of materials I have available, copper is definitely the winner. At least in terms of braking performance, because at nearly six times the cost and three times the weight, maybe aluminium would be better for other applications. The next factor to consider is the magnet orientation. In this first test, I have all the magnets mounted with their poles aligned, so the north face is pointing towards the camera. But what if I flip one set of magnets so we'll have a north-south north configuration? This slows the disc even further because the eddy currents in the copper disc are produced by a change in magnetic field. So having the magnetic field change with the flip magnets generates stronger eddy currents in the copper and therefore more resistance. I next wanted to test these smaller cube magnets as I can pack them tighter around the perimeter of the disc. And these produce so much resistance that I think we need to increase the weight. I also tried the cube magnets in a checkerboard configuration, but this seemed to perform worse. Since I've been using magnets I had laying around from older projects, I need to find some new magnets for this setup. The best option I could find online were these 10mm cube magnets, which should outperform the previous 8mm magnets, so I ordered 200 of them. But once mounted on the test rig, they performed very similar to the smaller magnets, despite being 200% larger in volume, which made me consider the quality of these magnets are skewing the results of this test. After a quick Google search, it seemed there are many grades of these neodymium magnets, and these seem to be on the lower end. So I had a search around to find a reputable seller of N52 grade magnets, which appeared to be the strongest. They were double the price, but it's clear why. Attaching the cheap magnets to my bench vise, I was able to suspend a single 1.2 kilogram weight below it. But with the N52 grade magnet, it could hold about two and a half times that. So I then printed a mount for these new magnets, and as you can see, they produce so much resistance that the disc barely moves. So now we know the combination of these high quality magnets and this copper disc produces such a high resistance force, how are we going to fit this on a bike? My initial plan was to mount the copper disc to the rear wheel spokes, as I've previously mounted pulleys for electric motor drives. But one issue is the spokes aren't designed to be a precision mounting point, 
so it will be very difficult to get the copper disc spinning perfectly straight to avoid hitting the small gaps between the magnets. The only other option is to mount everything to this thread on the hub, which is designed for just a single sprocket. So we need to fit a copper disc, a disc full of magnets, and a sprocket into this 12.5mm wide thread, which also has two different diameters and thread directions. The largest of which is apparently a standard bicycle imperial thread of 1.37 inch diameter and 24 threads per inch, which obviously makes things a little difficult as I can't exactly machine this thread. But fortunately we have a solution, as Form Labs have sent me their Form 3 Plus printer, and some of their rigid 4K resin. This 3D printer works by curing a resin with a UV laser, and this allows for much more precise and hopefully stronger parts than my other 3D printers. Once the print is complete, it needs to be cleaned in isopropyl alcohol, before going through a final UV cure to make sure the part is as strong as possible. Then simply break off the support and we have a mount for the copper disc, with the fine hub threads already printed in. Once threaded onto the hub, it's clear that this makes for a much straighter mount. But the question is, is it strong enough? Well I know how we can find out, as I also printed this rear sprocket from the same resin to see if it can handle the torque through the chain, without stripping the thin threads that lock it to the hub. And surprisingly, it worked quite well, for about a mile of mixed flat riding and slight uphills, until this happened. This seems like a big problem for the project, however it gave me some useful information. As we can see from the footage, the crack started from the sprocket teeth and moved inwards towards the hub, suggesting that the hub wasn't the weak point, but instead the design of the sprocket was, as it can't be thicker than 3mm and still mesh with the chain. So the next step is to cut a large copper disc that will be one half of the magnetic clutch and will directly drive the rear wheel. Then we need a lot of magnets mounting to a freely spinning hub that will be driven by the chain. But how many magnets do we actually need? I went back to the test rig and used this container of water to vary the weight hanging from the axle, which directly varies the torque on the disc. And this showed that the RPM of the disc is proportional to the torque applied. So if we plot a graph of torque versus RPM, we get a nice straight line. The next thing to test is how the RPM is affected by the number of magnets. So each test had a different number of magnet sets, with each set containing four magnets as I have two on the front and two on the back. And this result wasn't linear. So increasing the number of magnets didn't reduce the RPM proportionally. But from the first test we know that the weight is directly linked to the RPM so we can actually calculate the required weight we need to reach 100 RPM for each set of magnets. This now gives us a constant RPM value with a varying amount of torque, and can be used to calculate the dissipated power, which if we plot a graph of the power at 100 RPM, we get a straight line. So this means the number of magnets is directly linked to the power transfer through the clutch, and not the RPM. I then found this calculator online for working out the power required to ride a bike at a given speed. So let's say we want to ride at 10 miles per hour. We need a power output of about 68 watts. From the tests, I know that five sets of magnets can produce 7.8 watts at 100 RPM. This means that I'll need 44 sets of magnets and because there's four magnets per set, that's a total of 176 magnets. But there's a catch. This 100 RPM is the speed difference between the copper and the magnets, which at 10 miles per hour, the rear wheel and therefore the copper disc will be spinning at 135 RPM. So the magnets need to be spinning 100 RPM faster than that at 235 RPM. This might sound like a lot, but actually through the sprocket ratio on this bike, I only need to pedal at about 84 RPM to maintain the speed difference, which is definitely achievable. I then realised it was cheaper to buy these magnets in packs of 100, so I ordered 200 just to be safe, which seemed to wipe out their stock. And having 200 magnets means there's 50 sets, which should fit perfectly around the perimeter of the copper disc. I then press fit some bearings onto an adapter that matches the smaller thread on the hub. Then these bearings can be pressed into the rear sprocket that also has mounting holes for another disc that will be used to attach the magnets, which I cut from an aluminium sheet. 
Once everything is on the bike, it's easier to understand how this will all work. The chain spins the aluminium disc, which will eventually hold the 200 magnets, and it isn't linked to the rotation of the rear wheel or copper disc at all, due to the bearings. So the pedals and rear wheel spin completely independent of one another, and the only way to drive the rear wheel is through the magnets inducing current in the copper disc. I then 3D printed a magnet bracket using clear resin on the Form 3, and these turned out really nice. The magnets can then be pushed into position with the flipped polarity configuration, and attached to the aluminium disc with a couple bolts. By spinning the pedals, it's clear the magnets have an effect on the rear wheel, which is very promising as this is just 10% of the final number of magnets. But there is a slight issue, the chain sticks to them. To stop this from happening, the magnets need to be spaced further from the chain, which meant redesigning and printing new hub parts to move the clutch towards the wheel, as well as a thicker aluminium disc to prevent it flexing under the load of the magnets. Also, because the magnets stick to the spokes too, I had to squeeze the spokes together with cable ties to move them away from the clutch, which isn't structurally ideal, but this is a prototype. And now the magnets are able to spin freely without sticking to the chain, spokes, or steel bike frame, and we can get a sense for how this clutch both accelerates the wheel when the pedals spin and applies a braking force when the pedals are stopped. All we need to do now is mount the remaining 180 magnets to hopefully increase the torque transfer through the clutch. And with the rear wheel locked, there is a huge amount of resistance on the pedals, but the magnets are still able to spin. And with the pedals locked, the wheel is also able to spin and experiences the same resistance through the clutch. However, when both are able to spin, the pedals drive the rear wheel with ease and the braking force stops the wheel almost instantly. I think it's time to test this thing and see if we can actually move through the power of magnets. Let's go. Okay, it's kind of working. If, it just feels like I'm in a really low gear. Let's see what happens if I stop pedaling. Oh, I can really feel that resistance through the magnets. Let's turn around. Okay, hill now. Struggling a bit. Still able to move. I can't get much speed at the moment. Try and pedal quicker. <sighs> Ooh. Right, I mean it works. Uh, I think I might need to adjust the chain tension because it sounds like it's sticking to the magnets and then starting to jump off the sprocket. So let's tighten that a bit. In theory, the faster I pull, the more torque it should output, according to my previous tests. But like now I'm just matching the speed of the copper. And then if I stop pedaling, oh, I can really feel that resistance. It's a really weird sensation because it, it's, uh, I'm not directly linked to the, to the rear wheels. So it almost feels like I'm wheel spinning. If I put too much force in, it's very hard to keep a constant pedal speed with the, with the rear wheel. Okay, here we go and lock the pedals. So it's not quite as strong as a regular brake, uh, but it does slow it down a bit. <laughs> not bad. I think we need a larger sprocket on the front to increase the gear ratio. The reason why it feels like it's in a low gear is due to the difference in RPM between the magnets and the copper, because in order to generate eddy currents, the magnets must always be moving faster than the copper. Therefore to reach a higher speed, I need to adjust the sprocket ratio to spin the magnets faster. So I removed the original 45 tooth sprocket and machined my own 68 tooth sprocket, which should increase the ratio significantly, and has a diameter of 280 millimeters, which is the size limit for this bike frame. Fortunately, when buying new chains, they are slightly longer than most bikes need, so I didn't need to join two chains together to make up the extra length. This really helped when cycling, as I was able to maintain a pretty decent speed when riding on flat ground. It's difficult to explain exactly how this magnetic clutch feels, as it's so unique. When riding on smooth flat ground, as long as the magnets are spinning faster than the wheel, 
The torque at the rear wheel is determined by how fast you pedal. Also, the braking force seems to be a lot stronger at high speed, due to the difference in RPM of the magnets and the copper. So it's not great for bringing the bike to a complete stop, but if you wanted to bleed off some speed, it definitely has some advantages over a conventional brake, due to its no contact friction, which would save on brake pads. And that's the summary of the good features of this system. So would I recommend you build this for your own bike? Definitely not. You see, when climbing hills, it really struggles. The best way I can describe it is it's like riding on sand. Every turn of the pedals requires a lot of force and you barely move forwards. It might look like I'm riding in a low gear due to the pedals spinning faster than the wheel, but because the RPM difference between the magnets and copper is so large, the resistance is also really high. So I'm putting a lot of force through the pedals and going nowhere. Speaking of nowhere, I was exhausted after riding up this relatively easy hill. And if you're wondering where all my energy was going, well, when I got home, I took out my thermal camera and hopefully this makes it a little more obvious. Yep, the copper disc has heated up by about 20 degrees Celsius, which using the specific heat capacity of copper and the mass of this disc is about 8,000 joules of wasted energy. I had hoped it would somewhat simulate a continuously variable transmission where you could pedal at whatever speed you like and the clutch would vary the torque output depending on the inclination of ground you were riding on. However, the wasted heat energy makes it so much harder to ride and therefore I can't see it having any advantages over a direct chain drive. But hey, I had an idea and I wanted to test it which was made possible by OnShape, which is a professional grade computer aided design and product data management tool for businesses. And in fact, OnShape is used by Formlabs who create the Formlabs resin printer. OnShape was actually created by the same founders as SolidWorks because they saw that engineering teams needed product development tools that were more modern. So they created OnShape from scratch. And unlike other CAD programs, OnShape uses cloud native architecture, which allows for real time collaboration, can be used on mobiles and tablets, and much more. Plus, it means zero crashes, leading to no lost work. They continuously add new features every month, and one major update coming soon that I'm excited for is the addition of professional grade CAM, or computer aided manufacturing, as this will make it far easier for me to generate G code for running my CNC router. Overall, OnShape allows engineering and design teams to work far more efficiently. So if you or your business would like to try OnShape for free, go to onshape.pro forward slash Tom Stanton or check out the link in the description down below.